This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this week's episode, as we gear up to Starfield, he's taking a look at some of the weird and wonderful weaponry from the Fallout franchise. Really wacky to turn a, a convention. It's almost like they couldn't, they put in too much of a faithful 20th century firearm into the game and went, let's do a version that's an acid water pistol. If you want to see more of Jonathan's reactions to Fallout Guns, make sure to subscribe as we've got four previous videos on Bethesda's iconic franchise, and definitely keep an eye on GameSpot as across the next couple of weeks, we'll also be showing Jonathan the guns from Starfield as well. And if you're interested in buying Starfield, GameSpot's sister site Fanatical is selling the premium edition of the game, which includes early access. You can save 17% when you use the code FANATICAL17. Details are in the description of this video, and I have to let you know that GameSpot and Fanatical are both fandom companies. Right, over to Jonathan and the guns of Fallout. Right, the sniper rifle. It's a bit of a cludge, as I suppose it would be. The big barrel shroud with the negative space kind of looks cool, but isn't really doing anything. Typically with a precision rifle, you want the barrel to be unimpeded. Maybe it's meant to be a heat shield. I was never sure what all the, the knobs on the left side were supposed to do. They look like they move, but they don't get used. Uh, some shocking trigger discipline in, in this game has to be said, and some freakishly long fingers as well. <laughs> the finger is somehow wrapped around the pistol grip and through the trigger guard and is almost coming back on itself. But yeah, anatomically, not sure that's possible, but this is not expert reacts to fingers, uh, except for that gun from the other week. So a disintegrator, very, very classic sci-fi ray gun design with the sort of radiator flanges on it, lots of curves, lots of shiny metal. And um, disintegrator makes me think of Buck Rogers and the, the classic ray gun disintegrator pistol from that. And Looney Tunes, Daffy Duck and Marvin the Martian and all that, all which is already, you know, already now very old, but it was already poking fun at that sort of golden age of sci-fi design. Can't tell you how it works or how plausible it is, except that, as we have mentioned a number of times, portable direct energy weapons are simply not going to be a thing. We don't have the battery, energy storage, charging, all of that to pull that off when we have perfectly serviceable bullets that travel at lots of feet per second. I like that the reload is just... Give it a little, give it a little tap, a little slap. Yes, I saw the, the playful slap tap thing was, I noticed in third person. Yeah, well, it's something, I suppose. But normally it'd be some sort of heat sink ejection thing that you were hitting, but, um, or, or something along those lines. I don't know. I, I'm not sure energy weapons have reached their full gaming potential as yet. Something that's complex to manage, but super powerful seems to me to be the way to go with those. Okay, flaming plumbing sword. Almost taking your title literally. Fire, arms, handheld. No. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> it is a fire arm. I love that. Despite wearing power armor, when you equip this weapon, you have to use the oven glove. Ah. As if that's going to offer more protection than your Brotherhood of Steel power armor. Yeah. Third, well, I, I can dredge up a, a, a real-world anecdote for this one, which is that, uh, as some of you know, asbestos mittens were issued, certainly with the M60 and I think the, the original MG42, to handle hot barrels that needed to be changed before someone had the bright idea of attaching a carrying handle to the barrel. Uh, asbestos mittens, which means we occasionally run into such things and have a big panic because asbestos in museums is a a massive problem. As to the utility of setting your sword on fire, I don't think you need someone from the Royal Armouries to tell you that that's not really a good idea. Heat applied to a blade, like if it's enough heat to really be any use, is going to ruin the heat treatment of the blade. I mean, maybe it's not going to be at enough temperature to do that, but it seems like a bad idea to me. And if you're cutting someone with a sword, do you really also need to slightly burn them at the same time? Because I, you're not going to get enough heat on them for long enough to do any significant damage. What it might do is make the blade less effective by cauterizing the wound. It's 
So ob obvious Barrett inspiration with the shape of the buttstock, general configuration, heavy barrel, muzzle brake, scope, but it's not firing 50 cal rounds, surely. And says it's a sniper rifle, has the scope, but is automatic and says it's a machine. I don't know if that's meant to be a joke or what, but doesn't seem to make any sense at all. You definitely don't want an automatic sniper rifle. Something like a DMR might have an automatic capability for emergency, close range, CQB, whatever, because you are a bit closer to the enemy potentially in that role. But even then, several forces, including the British Army, selected DMRs that were semi-automatic only because we don't want to be overheating and dirtying up and wearing out your precision rifle by caning it on automatic like this chap in the straw hat. I know we've talked about flamethrowers quite a bit here and there, but firstly, this one's blue, so it's different. But also, we don't usually get quite so much in the way of pipes and a tank, and, and at least some implied detail like that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good effort in terms of well, for one thing, it has the igniter in front of the nozzle as a separate piece and is like meant to be glowing red hot. I think hot enough to ignite the fuel, I guess. And it does so. It definitely the design gets across that this is not a gun. This is something else with fuel and pipes and. Um, why the flame would be blue, I don't know. I mean, obviously, gas burners at a certain setting are, are give a blue flame, but that's just, that's quite an intense to do with the amount of oxygen and all that. So a bit a big sort of gout of flame like that probably ought not to be blue unless you're burning some other gas. I don't know. What it really doesn't get across is that thickened fuel thing that we've talked about before it doesn't feel like it's projecting burning liquid it really does feel like a hot gas which is definitely not pleasant but is nowhere near as lethal uh, as actual flamethrowers that project burning fuel i think we've shown our we've shown our lpo 50 flamethrower before that has three ignition cartridges at the muzzle that give it that sort of cluster of three barrels look which this has i think that's probably coincidence but it, it's just about possible that they, when they looked up Flamethrower, what they saw was the LPO, which has the semi-cylindrical multiple tank backpack and a three cartridge flame gun. Maybe that's the inspiration for this. It's certainly one of the more common and iconic uh, flamethrowers of the 1950s era that Fallout is sort of alluding to quite a bit. So maybe, right. I've burned myself out on the flamethrower. Okay, so clearly this is an M1 Garand. It's sort of, it's not quite a Garand. They've they've been pretty fast and loose with the details, but the overall look of the thing, eight round capacity, it's clearly meant to be that. It's just been changed up a bit for reasons. Um, so one of the one of the major differences is it's, it's very shallow in the in the action area. So the the bolt sits very low in the stock some, for some reason, leaving a huge thick receiver ring looking chamber there so or barrel around the chamber so the, that would make the barrel astonishingly thick and tapering right down from there don't know why they've done that what i've grabbed to show you because you've all seen a garand including on this um, series this is also an m1 garand believe it or not but it is us rifle and then scored out and sent them in Springfield Armory and a Garin serial number and added to the top is 7.62mm BM59 P Beretta 68. And that's because this is a 308, to use the game's terminology, or a 762 converted US M1 rifle for the Italian Army. So there have been some changes made. They have given it a 20 round detachable box magazine like the m14 they have added a selector switch here it's a parallel universe m14 kind of the other thing i noticed was that we're getting the iconic m1 ping but with a weird delay so we fire the last shot and then the gun has a bit of a think about it and then it pings out the on block clip whereas in reality the on block clip is attached to the round or it comes up with the round and then when you fire the uh, the cartridge case, the cartridge case is ejected and because there's no longer anything holding it in place, the clip rises up and flies out of the gun as well. So near simultaneously with the shot. So this is more like there's some mechanism going on 
inside. You don't have to reload or anything or have ammo. Oh, you don't need ammo for it? No, not, not that I could tell. Okay. Like, there's no ammo counts or anything. It implies that it's shooting, you know, like a shotgun sized shell or something, but it does. It's just the effect of the punch. That's a little disappointing to me. I think if you're going to have a gun based weapon, it should be ammo dependent. Design wise, it's dicey because your it looks like your wrist is free to, to pivot, which means that if it if you accidentally if you let your wrist go like that, you're going to shoot your own knuckles off. My initial impression was that the paddle at the front or the platform across the knuckles had rigid bars linked to the mechanism. That would that would make more sense. But it looks like it's sending some firing impulse to some, I don't know, is it like meant to be like a hydraulic system or pneumatic to actually fire the gun? So there's not been a huge amount of thought gone into how this would actually work. What it's presumably based on is the so-called Sedgley Fist Gun or the uh, Hand Firing Device Mark One. I, I think the, um, the American military called it. And this was the same sort of idea, but it's much more of a like a pocket pistol with a plunger at the front instead of a sort of a trigger at the back. And it's like a buff leather gauntlet with this device on the back of the hand. So not on the not on the forearm like this and not double barreled. It looks like it might be double barreled, but one of the barrels is not. It's a plunger and it sticks out so that you can punch someone and trigger the shot. Oh, I did mean to grab a sharps and forgot. To be fair, it isn't much like a sharps at all. It's just a trigger guard shape and maybe a bit of the receiver, but not really on this version. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really odd mashup. We, we've definitely got brain triggers for the sharps shaped trigger guard. And under the wooden stock, there is that angle shape to the receiver, which is there for the lifting block of the, or the, the dropping block, I should say of the Sharps design. But other than that, I mean, this version has what looks like a Mosin Nagant stock on it or, or something close to. It's, it's very much its own design. I guess it's meant to evoke both like late 19th century bolt actions, but also the mid 19th century Sharps. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a mixed bag. Ah yes, Gatling laser. Now forgive me if I ranted about this last time, but like the whole point of a Gatling gun is that it's a gun and you are using rotating breeches and barrels to increase your rate of fire and promote cooling. I don't necessarily think a directed energy weapon would benefit from, from that at all. What it really is, is the cool factor of a Gatling gun applied to a laser gun, plus the additional cool factor of a hot rod paint job on this one. It's still cool, of course. It's got the, the beams are sort of refracting as they hit that Mylurk there. The visual effects are, far, are very different than a gun. And then you get that meltdown disintegration, that's trademark of the, the Fallout DE weapons as well. So yeah, I think the only way this makes sense is if you, you're using Fallout laser rifle technology that has a limited rate of fire and by having them spin and trigger one after the other, you're mirroring the original intent of the Gatling gun to increase rate of fire in a similar way, which is a very obvious thing for me to say, but perhaps it makes more sense than I initially thought. Right, classic fallout problems here in that the cartridge cases are huge, they're not coming out hard enough, and the slide doesn't move, seemingly, until it does on its own when the gun's empty, at which point it locks itself open. The The gun itself is very obviously a, a Volta, a Volta, or Volta if you prefer, a PPK. I have grabbed for your delectation a cased example. It's not particularly old. This is a post-war example, but it does come in a, a nice case and spare magazine with flush fitting base plate. And then the gun itself is fitted with the version of the mag that's seen in the game, i.e. the extended base plate gives you people with relatively large hands or long fingers at least enough purchase to actually grasp the gun because this is truncated enough that without it, your little finger is going to be swinging in the breeze. So that is the preferred mag for the PPK, I think. I can't remember the story reason for this existing. Would this still be working 200 years into the nuclear apocalypse? Yeah, maybe. So it's, it's a simple blowback design. There's no locking mechanism. 
Uh, they're really nicely made, very nicely fitted. The, su the suppressor is very long and thin, and we seem to have an extended barrel that it's attached to. So there is no PPK that I know of with a barrel that extends out of the slide like that. It really defeats the object of it being a very short concealable gun that's barely longer than my hand is wide if you have a great big extra barrel sticking out the front um, and then a very long suppressor attached to that so it, it's a very odd looking gun kind of defies what i would imagine would be the purpose of having this which is the james bond 1950s 60s spy vibe Now, if I remember high school chemistry, uh, which I don't, highly corrosive acid won't melt glass, so the glass file bottle makes sense, but it will surely corrode the metal parts that it's immediately then being ejected through. Really wacky to turn a, a convention. It's almost like they couldn't, they put in too much of a faithful 20th century firearm into the game and went, let's do a version that's an acid water pistol. There is a lot of recoil for an acid spraying gun. I've never shot an acid spraying gun, but if you've ever fired a, fired, if you've ever shot a water pistol, oddly, there isn't much recoil. I see the pipe for the acid is rooted through the firing pin channel and therefore down the barrel. And we have some electrical cabling as well, for some reason. Yeah, it sort of implies it's an electrically actuated valve system. I don't know where the pressure's coming from. It's a weird rubbery thing hanging off the left-hand side. It looks, it looks like a plunger. Almost looks like you're meant to pump that up by hand to create the pressure needed to eject the acid. I am overthinking this. Right, well, we have our very own Silver Shroud Thompson gun. It is silver, but it's not actually silver. This is aluminium to use a compound of the American and British versions of that word, which I will never do again. Aluminium receiver, giving it that silver look. This is also fitted with experimental polymer furniture that clearly did not hold up to the task of the heat. These aluminium receivers were discovered on their own, and then a number of them were made up into guns. In this case, some really beautifully blued steel components giving a nice contrast. I fitted a 50 round drum mag as well because it fits the whole game gun thing. Which is to say, I don't believe the plastic furniture was ever on the aluminium guns. I believe they are two separate projects, but uh, I'd have to check the books to be sure. The 1928 model, which is what we have here, cocking handle on the top. This gun should not exist, but we're looking at on the screen here because it should either have the cocking handle on the top like this, or it should have it on the side like the M1, but on the right hand side. And it should not be capable of taking drum magazines. But apart from that, it's a pretty good representation of a Thompson gun. So a cool looking homemade or craft produced design, pretty realistic looking. Um, the screw or bolt rather as a trigger is a nice touch. Springs and some suggest suggestion there of firing pins to actually fire the cartridges but the way the gun works there's no movement going on there there's no trigger mechanism or hammers or strikers or anything that seems to be actually doing anything it's just magically firing all three cartridges and then magically ejecting them as well because this appears to have no extractor or ejector as part of the design so superficially it's a really nice and I don't mean that in a negative way. As it, as it, as we look at it, it's um, a nice bit of post-apocalyptic design. In fact, we have we have a double barrel thing here that looks very much like this. The the receiver at the back there, it's a cool design, but it doesn't make as much sense as the rest of the gun with the welded together tubes and the springs and the pipes and the bits of wood and the metal plates because that seems to be some sort of cast component that's custom designed and made for this gun, which would seem to fly in the face of it being homemade although it, the two sort of bulges on it for the barrel that, that, that form the, the sort of uh, recoil shield breech face of, of the gun kind of there are only two of those so maybe someone saw this shape on some other tool or device and thought oh, that could be a an action body or a receiver for a homemade shotgun don't know it kind of it kind of looks believable but it's one of those where the more you look at it the less sense it really makes
Thanks for watching, guys. Those were more guns from the Fallout games. Hope you enjoyed that. Please do come and check out uh, actual museums if you can over here in the UK. We've also got, of course, a website, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, our own YouTube channel, which features yours truly as well. Whatever you do, please do join us again next week here on GameSpot.